to create this video, I partnered with DesignCon. In this video, we are going to talk about how to simulate a channel. And when I say channel, it means, for example, if you are designing PCI Express and you would like to be sure uh, these uh, uh, tracks are routed properly and PCI Express signal quality is going to be okay between your processor and your board or connector or anything else, then you can use this video to actually learn how to do it and also what is important for this kind of design. Am I right, Bert? That's what we are going to talk about? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this is the simulation, what we will be doing later. But we have to start with something more, uh, more like, uh, what does it mean, channel? A channel would be something like a chip to a module. And for instance, uh, this chip here, you know, it, it would be the chip going through a via, uh, through a trace in the PC board to a connector to another little PC board in this module. Mm -hmm. So basically channel is not uh, only like PCB traces or something. Channel is basically the connection, whole connection, which may include like, um, in our case, it will be, everything will be basically on PCB, but whole channel is like from chip through balls or paths and then via tracks through connector. That's why we call it channel, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Typically, Least... but when we do simulations, can we simulate everything, or what do we usually? Simulate? Oh no, well, we well to build a channel, you need to model each individual piece, and then you put every you will put everything together, and that'll be the channel. Okay, basically, but and then that's... you'll simulate the whole channel end to end. That's what yeah. we will do later, correct? Yeah, we'll be doing doing some of that exactly. And, and why is this important? Why we would like to simulate channel? Well, if, uh, for instance, on you know, on this slide here, there's diff for each uh, there's different standards. So, like PCIe will have a standard, and they'll have some metrics to test the channel against to perform. This one, for instance, is IEEE 802.3 Ethernet standard, and I just pulled this particular because. That's what I'm going to focus on. And that's why loss is typically important. So in this Ethernet channel, there's uh, what they call it, a chip, a chip to module uh, specification. And in the document, you'll find like this 400 gig, uh, it's like 56 gig uh, PAM4 type signaling. And the channels, they got like 16 links going and it's going from a host chip to a PCB to what they call a module. And the module could be something that plugs in that goes to some other box or something. So they have this chip to module spec. And as you can see here, uh, they have some uh, loss metrics on it. So on the host board, you've got like seven and a half dB um, budget, you've budgeted 1.2 dB for the connector and your insertion loss of the module has got a budget of one and a half dB, mm -hmm. basically. So, so basically this means uh, when we go to higher frequencies, uh, it's not only about some kind of like damaging the signal, but also, uh, also, uh, when we use higher frequencies, signal is going to uh, be smaller and smaller and smaller. So basically that's what uh, this is helping us to uh, to meet. Uh, because if we don't meet this uh, loss, if we, for example, make this uh, PCB traces too long, it means the module may not work because signal which will arrive to the model will be too small, for example. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, you need to have some typical signal. So for instance, let's just look at just a simple transmission line. You know, this represents the loss of, 
of the transmission line. So there's two different parts of it. There's like the dielectric loss of the material and the conductor loss of the conductor. Then there's surface roughness of the conductor that contributes to more loss. Um, and I've just broken down this loss here. So this is what we call the insertion loss versus frequency. And this is the loss of uh, all sine wave frequencies up to 50 gigahertz. This is the loss of, say, the transmission line or a channel will look, you know, similar to this, but this is just a simple transmission line. And this just broken down to this red one is conductor loss, the blue is dielectric, and smooth, smooth, uh, smooth uh, copper is this pink. And then when you add roughness, it's here. Mm -hmm. So basically, so, the green one is kind of a real right. loss right. in channel, in real channel. Yes. Right. And, and we if can our see... channel was right, yeah, if we just say our channel is a transmission line right now without anything else, yes, that's what we would be looking at. Mm -hmm. So this is basically the reason maybe why someone would like to simulate their channels, because they would like to be sure they have enough margin to meet the required maximum exactly. loss. Okay. Right. So now if you look at this picture for why is loss important? If we, you know, we, we started with here, if this is the transmission line, that would represent this uh, line in the PCB without the vias, okay? So we need, with the vias and the transmission line from here to here, um, from the chip to this connector, this seven and a half dB has to include two vias and a transmission line. For 13.28 gigahertz. Sorry, for? For the 13.28 gigahertz. Right, at 13.2 uh, yeah. gigahertz. Yeah. We So, in other words, we'd go back, well, you know, roughly like this. Mm -hmm. This one's talking about roughness. If we don't consider roughness, you can see here, if you simulated just with red, for instance, and you measured 14 or 13.28, it's close enough. But when you added roughness, you have a delta of three and a quarter dB. And if you haven't accounted for it or, or understand the roughness or pick a foil that is smooth, you know, smoother roughness, when you build the board, you could end up with, uh, we've got, uh, what is it? 16% increase in jitter, 48% mm -hmm. of the eye height. Mm -hmm. You can see with it. So that's why loss is, is important per se. And channel modeling is important to ensure that when you build it, you're going to end up with uh, enough eye opening mm -hmm. in it. Then I'm, I'm really curious to see how the uh, material will influence it when we will do the simulation. Yeah. Okay. So what else know. we need to know before we do simulation? Okay. We need to know. So why is loss important? We talked about the channel, what it means, and we want a good signal back eventually at this little chip that's on this board that plugs in. You know, we want a good signal there. So in this Ethernet spec, spec um, this is like in a data center or a tele telecommunication office, they have racks of equipment. And Realistically, this is an example uh, taken from uh, like Samtech. They have a nice picture of the interior. But what you can see here, practically, you'll have a central chip and it's got to connect to all these modules across the front. So really that budget, you've got 7.3 dB from the chip to this outside end uh, module and similarly on this side. Mm -hmm. And typically, typically uh, in these boxes, that trace length could be anywhere from eight to nine inches mm -hmm. by the time it reaches there. So you you got to meet the seven and a half dB uh, from from there to there, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, the modules, that's anybody's module can now plug into, into this connector mm -hmm. from the front. So, you know, 
that has a loss budget of one and a half dB. So you have to make your own model of a one and a half dB loss in a connector. But mm -hmm. basically, if you're designing this board here, you've got to fit here. Or if you're a, a supplier of just the modules, you have to meet one and a half dB mm -hmm. on your board to I plug understand. in. You see what I'm saying? And these modules, they're like uh, optical plugs. So th there's this uh, this module looks here, and then uh, they have these plugs that plug in the front and connects to another rack of equipment over mm -hmm. here. For mm -hmm. instance. So that's how you connect racks to racks is through uh, through the plugs and through like a cable. And they could be optical cable. They could be uh, an electrical copper kind of cable to mm -hmm. connect it. Regardless. So the, the modules are kind of uh, changing the signal to to the physical interface, which will then continue further. Right. Module is so just right. something what uh, yeah what is interfacing to the processor on one yeah. side. On the other side, something else. Yeah. So you know the real channel is really from here to the end of basically the end of the connector so we're mm -hmm. worried about 7.3 db you know the other the other person that's supplying the module they have to meet one and a half yeah yeah so, I understand. You know, so when we simulate we'll build the whole channel 7.3 or whatever it is uh up to you know this whole thing I'm curious. So there is some kind of standard uh, interface between the processor and these modules. That's the IEE standard. So yeah. these are single-ended uh, signals, or what they are? No, they're they're typically at these high speeds. You differential. Know, they're, yeah, they're differential. They're okay, serial. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so <laughs> single-ended would not work for this. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> and uh, here's like and yeah. here's for instance like this is the channel. So part of that IEEE spec. They have this, uh, what they call host, and in order to evaluate this, they have what they call this host compliant board. Mm -hmm. And this host compliant board will plug in to one of these oh, sockets. That's nice. Here. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you would hook up your uh, VNA or test equipment, what they call this test point, test point 1A. And then they will have. Uh, an S parameter mask, for instance, that you have to meet. So your your loss of the whole channel at TP1A has to be above, above this line. This line. Mm -hmm. right? And then there's the uh, return loss, which is the reflections, has to be below this line, mm -hmm. essentially. So essentially, we, we have to build a channel to meet a spec. And for the example we're going to talk about today is IEEE standard. Um, that's really high speed and it has a lot of good demo type of thing to, to show that thing mm -hmm. so really we want to meet the channel has to be above this line and return loss really to be below um, but that in itself doesn't always mean the channel is going to work or not work sometimes you could have a you know things to be above this line but it may not work because of other reasons so i'm going to talk about channel operating margin which is a, 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 a new kind of a metric that you can apply on the channel and it'll go a little deeper. Uh, it'll take other metrics and really sort of stress the channel and the channel operating margin gives you an output number. If you meet the number, you pass or fail. Mm -hmm. So I'll be showing some of that mm -hmm. as well. Okay. So so yeah, that's the thing there. Um, and then I'm going to show basically well how we go about first, uh, you know, go about starting to model it. Well, first of all, you'll need to define a stack up where you have to choose material. Um, and then, you know, you start going from there. Uh, but before you go there, we know when you make a stack up, you know, uh, the symmetry typically when we fabricate the board has to be symmetrical. So if we look at a cross section, we'll typically have a core or a prepreg in the center. Uh, and then they build symmetrically above and below um, the center line. And typically we like to have equal weights of copper on the cores, uh, equal thicknesses on it as we build up. 
that's just general guidelines for uh, you know a good uh, stack up and we have good ground and power planes that are adjacent to one another so if, you know if we look at these two planes here one would be power one would be ground for instance um, but, but this is just a very high level view of building a stack up um, the next thing is you know we want to do is compare the dielectric material properties the dk and df this is interesting. So here I've picked, yeah, so here I pick, oh, DK is the dielectric constant and DF is the dissipation factor. And DF represents uh, how it, uh, how the loss of, is affected by the material, the dielectric material. And your camera uh, switched off. Oh, it switched off again? Yeah. I'm sure, I don't know. It, it switched off by itself. I didn't touch anything. I don't right. know why. Anyway, um, so compare dielectric material properties. The DF is the, um, it, it really affects the loss of the channel from a dielectric perspective. So we want something with a very low DF. So I've chosen two materials to compare. Uh, and I've chosen isolar materials here because the information is really readily, readily available online. They have a very good website you go and you can pick materials and everything's there. Some other laminate suppliers, they'll only show you um, what I call this data sheet. And it only has the DK and DF at a certain frequency. It's not what we use to build a stack up. Um, and if you need that other info, you have to contact the supplier or register and whatever, and then they'll send it separately. And it's usually got some confidentiality associated with it. So I didn't want to show any of that. So I chose Isola because they 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 have everything wide open. Mm -hmm. And it's I only for an example. I have a question. So sure. because it looks like the numbers are very similar, like, like 10 gigahertz is 3.92 uh, DK. 100 yeah. megahertz is 4.24. So which one would you choose? Do you need to choose the one for the signal? Well, the, D, is the that... DK is not as... The DK for the for loss, it's obviously important. The DK is more important for getting your characteristic impedance. impedance. yeah. Right. So I chose something that the DKs, well, they're not really that, you know, that close. I mean, this is near four. We're near three here, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, yeah. And, and and here you see the DF. It's point zero zero one five, and the DF here is point zero two. That's right. Big, big Order of magnitude difference, yeah. right? So this is your typical FR four type material, for lack of better term, you know. They probably got stuff worse, but this an FR four material have a DK of around four at at one gigahertz. We'll be looking at stuff at ten gigahertz mm -hmm. in our comparison because that's close to the thirteen point two eight in the spec. Mm -hmm. So I always choose uh, the dielectric properties at the frequency that I want it to uh, to be operating at or mm -hmm. the spec. Okay, okay. So, so uh, two important things. Uh, check uh, data sheet, check the values for the frequency what you will be running your signal at. And yeah. uh, DF may be even more important. DK oh. is just for information which you use right. to calculate, for example, impedance. But DF, yes. that's the parameter which is important for very high speed signals. You would like to have it as low as possible. Right. For loss, for the loss aspect. Now, DK is important as well because uh, a, a smaller DK will allow you to have a thinner board for the same impedance when you work it through. So, you know, it does have an effect if you're worried about thickness of your board now, for instance, you have to look at that too. And number of layers that you have. You have a lot of layers and uh, and you have a thickness requirement. Um, then you start looking at DK and, you know, a lower DK will allow you to have a thinner overall board 
basically for the same impedance. So mm -hmm. TK is still important, you know, but for loss, it's mainly the the dissipation mm -hmm. factor DF. Okay. So you know, so you start off basically looking at you know the two. I mean, sometimes depending on your design, you might be able to get away with an FR4 depending on the length of your channel or anything else. So just throwing it out, you know, throwing out a FR4 may not be it. But if you're building something here for a long length, you'll see, you know, you're not going to entertain anything like an FR4. Mm -hmm. you're okay. Looking, so this right? is this is also again important. So basically. Uh, sometimes people may think I'm designing for very high speed. Uh, I have to use expensive materials. But if the length of the tracks is very, very small, then it still may work perfectly fine, even with Maybe. standard materials. Maybe, right? Maybe. Okay. So it all depends. Like everything, signal integrity, it depends, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay, we can move right. to the next slide. What do you have on the next one? Yeah. So. You know, this is where you typically start. We start like with a stack up mm -hmm. of the board and, you know, choose some material. Like I picked this one because it's it's a relatively new material and it's it, it'll be good for the latest standards type thing. So mm -hmm. this would be typically something you would use at, you know, 56 or even 112 gig now to do something like this, mm -hmm. right? But other other laminate suppliers have similar materials, and the DKs and DFs are on the same range, mm -hmm. right? It's not just unique to there. But for this is very good for the example here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next thing we need to look at because we, I, I mentioned that roughness is important. Um, part of the data sheet here, uh, when you go on the, the website. They'll have the full data sheet, and part of the full data sheet will show um, the copper foil type that's used on the laminate itself. Mm -hmm. So for HR 370HR, I've highlighted here the HTE grade three or RTF reverse treated foil are options. So I, I picked, uh, you know, I went online and find the data sheet of HTE and uh, and reverse treated foil. Um, you could also contact the supplier and ask, well, who's the foil supplier? And they'll tell you, then you can go to the foil supplier and get the data sheet of the foil. Mm -hmm. And here you'll have the roughness parameters that you need later on for our simulation. Mm -hmm. So you need to gather this info as part of your comparison. So for Isola, we can only get a foil in HTE or RTF, and you can see HTE, the roughness of the foil for 18 micron, which is a half ounce or one ounce foil, it's either five microns or seven. So it's very rough foil for uh, HTE. And you can see the roughness of the profile is shown in these pictures here. There's two sides of the foil. This laminate side gets bonded to the core material. And the other side, they often call resist or shiny side. If I look at this picture, this core, they have the, the rough side. And then the prepreg is this other side of the foil. And that's what uh, is showing basically here. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, they only give you the laminate side of the foil that goes to the core. Because when they build the PCB, the board shop now is going to uh, add additional roughness to the prepreg side of the foil. Yeah, I, I've seen it. I will show it in in the video what I'm preparing. Like before, actually, the, it goes to oven. They have to do some. They have to make it rougher so it sticks better together. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, the board shop. That's the board shop needs to make it rougher, um, so that when they put this all together. You know, this prepreg, think of it as the glue that glues these cores together. And you need to have some sort of roughening on the on the foil itself to get better bonding uh, when they press everything together. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's really this resist side. Okay. And you can see that side is typically smoother. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
Now, when you look at this MLSG, that's typically a, uh, an RTF, reverse treated foil. Mm -hmm. That means they, they put additional treatment on the smooth side, like here, and then that will get bonded to the core. And then this resist side is just, you know, normally this roughness. So that's typically how they show this picture here. You know, at the bottom, that's typically the laminate side. Mm -hmm. and over here, the smoother side or, or the treated side is this bumpier side on the top here. So that's typically, you know, how they, they refer to it. Regardless, um, you know, you can see that the reverse treated foil, the RZ is... is uh, Much bigger. It's three. Ah, okay, three. three. It's only three. Okay. Three versus five or mm -hmm. seven. See? So typically, you want to use foil with a, a lower roughness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, certainly wouldn't choose HTE foil when I built the stack up. I would specify if I was using uh, 370 HR, I would use the smoothest that I can, which is the RTF. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it, regardless, you, if you have two options, you pick the lower roughness option. Uh, really, that's what I'm trying to show here. When we will do simulation, we will try, we try different roughness to see well, how it... I will use... Different material. For, well, for instance, for ISOLO, I will use basically the numbers. That oh, I okay, which are here, okay. Right? And if I use uh, ISOLA, I'll use the roughness from a data sheet. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. And you'll see the difference, okay. obviously. It's the whole, the whole, it's, it's not just like one little thing. I mean, playing with roughness, all you're going to do is, if I go back to here, all you're going to see is this line mm -hmm. go closer or whatever here. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's just like the rougher it is, the more loss you're going to get. Excuse me, from the foil. So, you know, that's step two is really now picking, you know, looking at the roughness of the foil for it and, and gathering the data because you're going to need this data when we do the channel modeling. So we're at the gathering stage now, help with our decisions. Mm -hmm. The next step, if we build a stack up, once we've chosen a material, like say we chose 370 HR or Terra Green, once we've chosen which one, and here I'm just comparing the two, um, they have what they call these dielectric constant dissipation uh, DF tables. They're construction tables, what we call them. And this is what the board shop uses to, to make their stack up. They will get numbers from here, not from here. Okay. Okay. So, so what is if, the difference? What, why we would like to... Well, when we build it, um, if I blow up one, if I blow up this one a little bit more, you can see a typical construction table. If I start on the left, this column here is what we call the glass style. So this describes the weave pattern of the of the fiberglass because for PCB um, laminates, it's not just uh, resin. It's made up of resin and fiberglass cloth. Do you have a picture? Uh, do I have a picture? But not a picture, just hold a second. I got better than a picture. I have a model. Uh, okay. So uh, it's getting bummed up because of that. <laughs> yeah, but I see it, I see it. So this is like this is the fire this would represent the fiberglass weave that's in uh in your laminate your pcb when you buy a core material with copper on both sides the dielectric has got fiberglass weave like this and then let's just say let's just call this the you know the the uh the stuff so the uh, the, the, the resin, for instance, you know, and everything is put together like this. So if you can envision your resin is all mixed in with this, it's what it called, you know, that's what it is. 
So each one has a different glass style. So a 1035 weave will define how wide these pieces mm -hmm. are, the different weave patterns. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that and can be more, like also more bigger space between them or yes, something. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. So there is so, inconsistency, bigger space there is, there is uh basically when signal travels, yes. yeah, it yeah. will see like resin yeah. and the fiber, resin right. fiber. So what happens when they spread it, the actual pieces that are coming here, they actually spread the little fibers to fill in the space. So now, you know, it's still got a, a shape to it, but <laughs> it's not totally open like this. The glass is more spread out. So they call it spread weave. And usually this 1035 numbers or 1078, it'll define what this weave mm -hmm. looks like. Mm -hmm. Right? You so know, smaller is better then or what? Well, spread weave, you, you want to, you don't want to, you want to fill the spaces. Yeah. There. Okay. You don't, don't have, have big spaces. Yeah, okay. I don't have really slides to show this i have other presentations where i have talked about it certainly for sure but not uh, I, I think we talk it. about this in our previous presentation i will link it i think so so let's not focus too much on the weave itself it's going to be different weaves but more importantly uh, this tells how much uh, resin content is in in uh, the dielectric versus glass so here it says you know, of this, of the thickness, each one of these have another thickness too. So before I get into the resin, each one of these glass styles will have a, a, a thickness of the laminate. And that's important when you go to build your stack up because you want to build up um, the different thicknesses so you can calculate impedance in the whole bit. So you know, once you start doing your impedances, you, you say, I need this much thickness. So you'll look on this table and say, oh, I need a, I'll need one layer of this and another layer of this, and it'll build up. So board shops use this, it has the thicknesses, and it has the DK and DF at the different frequencies mm -hmm. of interest, right? And we need this DK and DF when we do this impedance calculations. So that's why these tables are important. They're used when we actually build the stack up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm really focusing on, you really need this data to build a stack up. And then when I go to doing a stack up, for example, this would be a typical stack up. And you'll see here, <laughs> excuse me, I need to get a drink. Okay, so I just made a um, a hypothetical stack up just for this demo. It's um, it's uh, ten layers, top layer to bottom is ten layers, and it's very it's a very simple one just for the demonstration. Mm -hmm. it, it's showing a core and prepreg, or sorry, in the middle is uh, um, two planes in the middle uh, should be plane plane between five and six there's two planes there and then i have like signal three is a high speed layer and signal eight will be another right now if you add more layers you, you could add more signal layers but they'll be pretty similar to this so for the demo i'm restricting it to just uh, uh signals on a short layer and signals on a longer layer through the board for instance, on layer eight, uh, we're going to look at the difference of the vias performance, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but before we get to that, you basically would do this. And here is like board shops will use a 2D field solver. Many board shops use polar um, field solver. Uh, I use polar for doing the things to calculate my uh, impedances. Uh, and if I'm building a stack up to validate things. So I just did a hypothetical one, like board shops would do each layer that has impedance, they'll do a, uh, a polar simulation for it. So this is an example of, a, of the top layer, microstrip. Um, the layer width is uh, eight mil wide. We want a 50 ohm impedance. 
uh, for single-ended, I didn't show the single-ended one. And for differential, uh, 100 plus or minus 10%, that's what our spec is. So you play with the different thicknesses that you need. And here you can see 2 times 1067, <laughs> the dielectric thickness is 4.6 when you put it together, OK? And then I got 3.65 from the table and the DF from the table mm -hmm. at 10 gigahertz, right? Mm -hmm. Then the press thickness after you press it. So the prepreg, for instance, we want prepreg here. The prepreg, you know, 2 times 1067 ends up being 4.6 mils thick. But after they press the board all down together, uh, the press thickness you know, is roughly the uh, thickness of the uh, of the copper that fills in the space. So you lose resin for pressing, basically. And the board shop, their process, they will they will know what the press thickness is in mills. So I just approximated this right now for the demonstration mm -hmm. of four point five. And how, this do, is the, how do they know or uh, they have some kind of the software what they use they, it can calculate how much space will be filled up with the yeah uh, so okay. let me just, uh -huh. let's, let's go back to here so yeah I, thing, I know what what will happen basically the resin it it will flow into empty spaces between exactly. the right tracks right so you know I th you know you can estimate it's based on amount of copper balance that's on on the on your layer mm -hmm. so after your pattern that you etch all the copper away it's going to have amount of percent copper and the less copper you have you know on there with all your tracks the more resin you're going to lose so that's why they have um you know this thieving stuff where they add extra copper to fill to balance the, the thing out you, know, you make it roughly like say 50 percent so you know, the board shops, they can calculate how much volume they're going to lose of resin that they have. Mm -hmm. And that's where this resin content comes into play. So high resin content means things will flow, you know, flow more and everything else. Mm -hmm. So board shops will know what it is. I don't, you know, when I do the thing, I really start here as a rough point from an SI perspective. I'll start here. Then I'll work, when I have this proposal, for instance, I'll give it to now the board shop that I'm going to be fabricating with. And I'm saying, okay, please sanitize my numbers mm -hmm. and give me back what you think these things should be and what the impedances will be, mm -hmm. right? And we go back and forth this way. It's not like I just hand it over. You need to, when you're doing high speed stuff, you know, you need to go back and forth with your fabrication. I, I know this. Right. You can't work in isolation and then give it to the board shop. Or you can't say to the board shop, just give me something. You know, you need to do some stuff ahead of time. I would so, like to... I, I'm sorry yeah. for interrupting. I yeah. would like to uh, talk a little bit about when people uh, have to start to worry about all these small numbers. Because sometimes we make this kind of video and then people are designing, I don't know, a microcontroller board and they start playing with uh, copper roughness or something. And uh, uh, so when they really should be so detailed, what frequency, for example? Well, for me, the way I work is everything over a gigahertz, I, you know, I want to be... Uh, I want to be more involved. If you're worried okay. about loss and impedance reflections, you know, if you're if you're worried about impedance, you need to know these numbers, right? You know, the, certainly certainly anything over like the 20 gigahertz, or let's say PCIe, let's say Gen uh, one, two, Gen three. Gen three above, you start. You need to start paying attention to. Gen three is what frequency? I think that's sixteen. Sixteen. Gen one is no. Wait a minute. Hmm. Gen Gen three is eight. Gen 
four, I think, is sixteen. Right. Okay. I have to. I have so to. So basically, count. about maybe five gigahertz. Yeah. Well, I I typically do it. Mm -hmm. Right. I have another question before we continue. So, where did you get these numbers for copper foil, the DK and DF? Oh, oh, this. Ah, okay. That's a good question. For Very copper, good. copper foil, not for prepack. Yeah. So copper, yeah. right? So this, uh, this is. Okay. Let me. Best, best to show this up in here. I can blow this up a little bit. So that DKDF, that represents uh, the resin that fills the space uh, between the copper traces. Between oh. the copper traces, you're not going to have any uh, fiberglass, right? The fiberglass, it's mixed in when you press oh, it. Oh, I understand. So it's right. not the DF and DK of the copper itself, but that's it's right. on it's the resin that's on the good. layer where the yes, copper is. That's a, yeah, very good point that you brought that up. Because uh, when you go to do the modeling, you can see here, that'll represent the, the resin in here. That's the RER, mm -hmm. right? And that's the DKDF in here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes. So when you have like this is a strip line. When you have strip line means you have a reference plane on top mm -hmm. and a reference plane on the bottom. And between them. Signals are there. So when you fabricate a board, pretty much you're going to have three DKs. You're going to have the DK of the core, like H1. You're going to have the DK of... Uh, they call it H2 here, and that includes this. But you're going to have the DK, you know, here, and then you're going to have the DK in between. They're going to be different numbers. And the core you get from the construction table, uh, like here, construction tables will have core data. And construction table, I didn't show the full thing. <clears throat> There's a table for the prepregs as well, like 11035 prepreg. Will have numbers. I didn't have a slide for mm -hmm. all of this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, but they're based, and you can see here the prepreg <clears throat> two ten sixty seven. The prepreg is uh, three point six five, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, here the two ten eighty is a different one to get the right thickness for the impedance. You can see the DK is uh, three point nine nine, right? And then the copper. Um, DK is, is hard to estimate. So it's not, so what I do is I go to um, the construction table and and I look at the prepreg, not the core data, but the prepreg data. I'll pick the, the prepreg that has the highest resin content in the whole table, right? If it's 76 or 80%, I'll pick that as a number to put in, mm -hmm. okay? You know, it's not a huge deal. If you have, if this is half ounce copper, it's not gonna make a huge deal. So it depends how precise you wanna be. Most people just use the same number as the prepreg layer, mm -hmm. right? And you'll be close enough. You're mm -hmm. not, it's not gonna be a drastic change in impedance, mm -hmm. right? Um, for me, I try to put every little bit into it. Mm -hmm. So Okay, so you uh, use the highest resin because basically that will be the closest to the 100% resin. Pretty much. That's okay. what I say, right? Okay. And, you know, uh, the, it's like, uh, you know how Eric Bogatin, our friend Eric, likes to say, an answer now is sometimes better than a good answer late. <laughs> so, you know... You know it's not going to be as high as the core, or or even with the the real prepreg. So and you're gonna, you know, it's going to be somewhere less than or you know, less than that, right? Because the resin typically has the DKs are lower than than the copper mm -hmm. itself or the 
the dielectric. Okay, I think, the, uh, is it everything about this table? Or we can maybe move to the next slide. Yeah, yeah. So, so I did a stack up for 370 HR, and then I did something similar for TG400. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I tried to have something roughly the same thicknesses it's going to be, and I chose materials to be that way to get impedances. Mm -hmm. But what you'll notice the difference is, um, is the line width in space. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here you see 3.59 is needed and 10 mil wide separation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for, for the thing um, to get like a 13 mil pitch between the two versus uh, here, I can get a, a, a wider, mm -hmm. wider line width for the same 10 mil space, okay? What's and, pitch? Oh, the pitch is the, between the two traces, center to center. Ah, okay, I understand, okay. Yeah, so uh, I put the pitch column in because sometimes people just do pitch and don't put space, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have line width and pitch, mm -hmm. then you have to subtract the two to get the space. Because when you do this modeling, this tool wants a space, right? It doesn't want pitch. Other tools may want pitch, mm -hmm. right? So I put both in the column here. Okay. So you can calculate either. Obviously, this is adding the two together, you'll get the pitch, mm -hmm. right? Anyway, but the nice, the important thing here is you see part of the loss of your channel, the narrower line widths uh, will have more loss too. Okay. So you know, it's not just the roughness, but the, the width of the trace will also contribute to the loss. So here you can see, well, we can achieve 3.59. We're going to have a narrower trace anyway, mm -hmm. compared to here. So the, the, the so we see here that that lower DK, the lower DK numbers we're using allows us to get a wider trace mm -hmm. for the same, you know. And why does it mean there will be a lower loss? loss as well so we're benefiting as that as well so dk when we go back earlier as is another thing why it's still important right mm -hmm. for impedance but it does factor into the loss mm -hmm. as well and you can see i tried to make this stack up so they're comparable for 62 mil thick or what is it 1.5 millimeter mm -hmm. board, right Roughly. okay so, so this is what we get... will need for the simulations take up yeah i tried to make the board thickness is the same, you know, as if you're trying to make A versus B in all respects. You can't do it exactly, but it's close enough, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I, I've done I've done the two things. So now comes uh, common roughness models that are used in the simulation tools that are out there. So if we go back to our equation that we started with for the transmission line. We have the dielectric loss, that's the DF basically works into it, then the insertion loss of the conductor itself. And then they have this correction factor, which we just call K, K surface roughness. This K applies to the conductor. So you apply this roughness model to the conductor loss. So basically there's three different models out there, popular models. There's some other ones too, but the Hammerstad model has been basically the first model that really has been dealing with roughness uh, for, for decades. And back down to originally the work from uh, Morgan, uh, did a lot of work in 1949, I believe. And then Hammerstad and Jensen, they took it further. They came up with this uh, uh, correction factor equation, simple, KSR to here. And this delta symbol is really the roughness of the peak to peak. And they basically modeled the roughness as a triangular profile of that. Mm -hmm. And and when you took the, the peak to peak height of that triangular profile, and they said that was the RMS value of the triangular profile. Okay. And mm -hmm. that's what, so 
we can use that RZ number that you had in this table. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or when we put that in. So you'd use RZ divided by two root three and you put that number in. And that's been fine. That model has been good for a number of years, uh, but it started to lose steam uh, between three and 15 gigahertz for accuracy. Okay. And then around 2009 timeframe, that's when uh, this hurry snowball model came onto the scene. Uh, it proved to be very accurate past the 15, all the way, you know, 50 gigahertz, you can get it to match really well. Uh, the difficulty with the hurry snowball model was um, you needed to get, uh, it relied on getting uh, scanning electron microscope pictures of the roughness profile. And that's what we see here is the roughness profile. And then, you know, you'd assume from this, you can measure a hexagonal arrangement and then measure these little, little balls, uh, and then number of spheres, very complicated. Most people, you, you wouldn't be able to do it. Most people use the hurry snowball model. Um, if they had measured data, you know, they measured something and then they would fit these parameters till they got a good fit to that model. Okay. And then they would use those numbers, um, for their future modeling. So that's, that's fine. But if you're doing a design from the start, it doesn't really help you. Uh, the Hammerstad would work because you have the RZ numbers. So around 10 years ago now, I started investigating, is there a way to um, come up with something similar? And I've come up with what we now call the Cannonball Hooray model. It's uh, based on this cannonball stacking of equal spheres, uh, 14 equal spheres. They're stacked in an arrangement like they used to stack cannonballs. And basically, we still use the same idea as Hammerstad. We use the RZ peak to peak uh, number in it. And eventually, the equation simplifies to just this. And the nice thing about it, it has the simplicity of Hammerstad and the accuracy of the Hooray model <clears throat> um, in there. And I've done several papers since over the last 10 years on all this modeling. All on my website, certainly all the detail about this is there. But suffice to say right now, uh, <clears throat> if you have RZ, the radius of the sphere that you need for this Hooray is simply 0.06 times RZ. And the area of the flat, A flat, is simply 36 times the radius squared. Okay. We don't have to worry too much about it because many tools now have uh, the Hooray model built in. Okay. And this table I put together is, uh, is showing popular tools that use a version. So mm -hmm. like, you know, you can use the Cannonball Hooray model. Some tools have it directly in the tool. So Polar SI 9000 E, they were actually the first company to adopt my model in it, which is very nice. And similarly, Mentor, Hyperlinks, now Siemens, basically. They have a cannonball hooray option, uh, Z0, uh, Z solver. You know, these, these people here, they mm -hmm. include it directly. So all you really need to do is put RZ number mm -hmm. okay. Okay, in that tool. Okay. Now, when we go to ANSYS, like HFSS type thing, or cadence tool, requires uh, what they call a surface ratio and nodule radius parameters for their Hooray model. And really, that's just this part of the equation. Mm -hmm. So the nice thing about my Cannonball Hooray model is uh, this SR for these two tools will always be 4.9. Mm -hmm. Always. It cancels out to that. 
So it's a constant. And then you're left with just an RZ. Mm -hmm. You just put the RZ and you calculate uh, R by 0 0.6, mm -hmm. 0 0.06 times uh, okay. RZ. I, I've got this. So for the other software, it's similar. Well, yeah, you can use these numbers which are in the table. Yeah, simply or simply. Yeah, we can and, move to the next right. slide because I, I'm a little bit worried we will run out of time. <laughs> okay, okay. So the, where do we get four numbers? Well, I talked about you go from data sheet. That's okay. Now, now the point is, uh, now that's uh, that's fine for the laminate. In the PCB shop, I said before, they add roughness to the foil, to the shiny side. So typically, you know, you find out uh, where do we get they, that's called the oxide or oxide alternative that they put on. And, you know, you can get that from the board shop or if you know what they have or from other data. But you need that number to put on the other side of the foil when you do the simulation. That's all I'm really saying. And I guess we can go now to a demo. Okay. Uh, transmission line model, right? Okay, so we have so, the... Uh, stack up we have all the numbers and right. everything what we need now yeah. we have to fill right. it up so into I'm our simulation go through this exactly so that's a thing so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to start up my like a polar for instance mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh so when you first start up polar you're presented with like a screen like this right uh this is the before we start, so uh, people can use also different software, correct? But oh, well, absolutely. Absolutely. We're not focused Promoting on... Polar or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can use any 2D solver you want. Um, I'm, I'm showing a demo for Polar because mainly that's what I use and a lot of board shops use it. So it, it's good. But the process is very similar and you'll see Polar not only does stack up, but it also does the transmission line model that we'll need. Okay. Okay. So, so we'll start with that. So we end up with like a 2D solver. Uh, like this is what other software will have separately, for instance. So you'd put in the parameters from the stack up. Uh, if I get, if I pull the board up. <clears throat> Reduce this down a little bit, just to just to show. I think this is the TG. Oops, wrong one. Yeah, this is uh, four point. Yeah, this is the TG. Mm -hmm. So you already loaded. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So I, you would put in you put in the numbers from H one, for instance. H one is uh, five point one. Mm -hmm. thickness here mm -hmm. you put in the thicknesses mm -hmm. and the press thicknesses you'd be dealing with so this column you'd use you know to put in uh, these different numbers here mm -hmm. right for h2 and the spacings and things and what, the line width the yeah, line what width about is, this upper and lower uh, line width oh yeah so this represents the etch factor so when they etch out the pattern you know, the etching will control that angle. So, you know, different software tools will ask, oh, what's the, they'll ask for an angle to put in. So you'd have to calculate the angle. Polar says, oh, W1, W2. So typically, you know, for just a normal process, you might lose, this is a typical thing. So it's point uh, three. I put uh, one. Uh, four. By, for about a mil. Yeah, one mil. one mil. Oh, the nice thing about Polar too, it automatically converts to microns mm -hmm. if you like using microns. Uh, I'm used to the mills, so okay. um, it, it's that. So we'll talk about that. You know. I would like to just add uh, for anyone sure. who doesn't know exactly why this is happening, I believe it's because the acid will, uh, uh, yes. will. Uh, longer be on the surface then it's going down and down now that's why it will be like this yeah so but yes you're right you you have your circuit pattern on it when they start etching that copper you know if they the etching controls that so you know they can 
very good board shops can make pretty square traces. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so you can play with that number to see the effect, you know, on impedance. For instance, if I... No, no, you don't need to change it. Don't change anything. Okay. okay. But you can see, you know, you can. that's why the solver, you can do the what-if analysis, right? And you can use that to define in your fabrication notes now what etch angle you want, mm -hmm. if it's important. I'm to... pretty sure they would be very happy. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but you know, you have that flexibility. So that's really what's showing here, W1, W2. And the other thing that's important is um, when you do a field solver, the wide side of the trace will always be on the core. Yes. Okay. So when you're looking at the your stack up, it's important to identify what the core layer is, you know, and do things uh, correctly properly here mm -hmm. because this is one picture sometimes uh you know it could be flipped when you look on the actual layer the mm -hmm. core is the other way around right and you know if you're not paying attention so h1 always make sure it's core mm -hmm. and with polar you have to add uh you know this pre-preg layer plus the thickness of the trace because it shows h2 is to the bottom mm -hmm. Other software will, will go to the top of the trace, okay, as an H2. Mm -hmm. So that's just something, you know, unique to Polar, but something to be aware of. Regardless, you just need to know your two. So once you do that, you know, you work this to get your impedance that you want, basically. Okay, and another question. So the separation region, the electric, that's the one what we were talking about. Okay. The last yes. one, the last one, R, E, R. Yeah, that's exactly, that's that resin. Okay. Here, right? You'd fill that in. And Polar has all different types of, uh, you know, whatever you have. If you have coated microstrip, you mm -hmm. have all this stuff. So that's why it's a useful tool for mm -hmm. stack up design. Okay? I, I wanted to talk about these numbers because I remember seeing these tables many times and I was like, oh, usually I only know, I don't know, six of these parameters. I have no idea what are the other parameters, what to fill up. That's why I wanted to talk about this a little bit more. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything? No, there is. Ask? Okay. I ask everything. We can move. Okay. Okay. Fine. Now, once you have your stack up, you got your impedance and everything. So now we we'll want to, um, you know, model the length of trace that we want to use. But How did you we... get the impedance? You just press the button or what oh, was there? There's there's these tabs here. Just calculate. Okay. okay. Yeah. Lossless mm -hmm. calculation mm -hmm. really gives you just the impedance of the cross section. But you clicked on the calculate button where the impedance is, yeah? Well no, at the bottom at the bottom there's these tabs. Here. Yeah, but I mean, how did you calculate differential impedance? You press the calculate oh. button. Oh, okay. Once you put all these numbers yeah. in, you click the button. Okay. And it and it calculates. Okay. Right? It, it's straightforward. And if you want to know more, like when you click more, it gives you more uh, more stuff. It gives you the differential. It gives you the odd mode impedance, even mode, common mode impedance, mm -hmm. you know, effective dielectric constant. It gives you... A, the, the near and crosstalk uh, coefficient number, um, coupling percentage. Mm -hmm. It's got a bit of extra stuff. Cool. Uh, but really, after you put in the numbers, you calculate, right? In it. Okay. So the next thing is uh, so now we've got our impedance. Now we want to have different lengths of transmission lines. Okay. But before you do that, you need to. Uh, go into the, uh, because your dielectric won't be constant decay over the whole frequency, right? It, it, it's it's just not. So you have to go and, and put in what they call a causal causal dielectric model. Mm -hmm. And regardless, it, ha it has that feature, so you just edit it. And then you would put the decay for the three regions in here. At H1, you'd put the decay that you had on the first sheet, uh, DK. And then here's where you put DF, right, mm -hmm. in it. So you put DK, DF, and the frequency, 10 gigahertz, right? 
So for these three regions, you put in the DK and everything. Mm -hmm. And now you can hit calculate. And in a, in a moment here, you'll see, uh, you can see here, uh, the dielectric oh. is not constant over frequency, right? At 10 gigahertz, it's uh, 3.1. But at 50 gigahertz, for instance, it's uh, less than that. So this shows you how the dielectric will behave over frequency. Based on the model you selected. Okay. Yes, the causal, causal dielectric model, it's important. If you have a constant, you know, it just it's just flat. Mm -hmm. okay? For modeling, you don't want that. You mm -hmm. want a causal, causal model. Okay. And uh, so it has that. So you have to put these numbers in in order to get your transmission line model that we're going to use. Mm -hmm. So we close that and here's where we add the roughness now mm -hmm. as a roughness here and we if we don't enable then then you have to guess what these numbers are mm -hmm. right when you put enable it now you put the roughness on each side like i show here mm -hmm. this is from the data sheet as i told you you know the mat side 1.1 from the data sheet and then the drum side i picked 1.5 from oxide from that sheet mm -hmm. that I showed. Okay. So you put those two numbers in, hit calculate, and then it puts the right numbers mm -hmm. in here that you want and hit apply. So now we're, uh, we're, we're pretty much there. And then here, uh, so what line lengths do we want? So here's, we're in mils, or if you want to put micron, or if you want to put millimeter, it just changes everything mm -hmm. automatically for you. So it's, we're, we're one inch right now or a thousand mils. And if I hit calculate, it's uh, it's, it's going to run through just quickly. And we'll see, we'll see how things will show up here. Mm -hmm. And so these are basically the graphs what we could see in your presentation. Yeah. So you, exactly. you used, you set up all these numbers, you set the length, what you needed. And now it will tell right. us uh, for this specific length, what we said, yes. uh, how much loss we will have for each frequency. Yeah, so when this finishes, it'll display things on the graph here. And uh, it, it's doing a second pass because there's two traces. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fine. Okay, you said the minimum frequency 10 megahertz, uh, maximum 50 yeah, gigahertz. Up to, up to 50. So mm -hmm. I'm simulating between, yes, between 10 and 50 mm -hmm. gigahertz. And I have like 2000 steps mm -hmm. in between. So it's gonna calculate everything. It's gonna take the dielectric and DF here, and it's gonna take the roughness, and it's gonna plot it all out. Oh, this is very nice, actually. Wow. Here you go. So here you see, the green will show the loss for dielectric. Oh. The red will show smooth conductor loss with no roughness just the conductor by itself. The blue will show smooth attenuation when you combine the dielectric and the, and the copper and no roughness, you'll get blue. And then conductor loss with roughness is uh, just, just the conductor with roughness is yellow. But the most important is this final one mm -hmm. where it puts everything together. And here you can see, you know, you can go from the thing here. Uh, if I click roughly where I want, it'll show up here mm -hmm. on the box here. Uh, we're at 1.03, you know, at that frequency. Mega so this is 25. the good material, I don't remember, or this is yes, the FR4. this is the good one. Mm -hmm. This is the TG. Because these numbers are very low. Yeah, the yeah, DB no, is very it's, low. And, yeah. and it's one inch, too. This yeah. is per inch. Okay, so... You play this, you know, this is very nice for the display, but the very nice thing about S uh, Polar SI9000, because you're already in the tool, is now I can save this in a touchstone file or S parameters, mm -hmm. which I'm going to use now to make the channel model, mm -hmm. right? So basically, so, S parameter is something, is the model of our trace in our specific uh, stack up and then when we do simulations we will basically work with real pcb track that's the model what we will generate now right exactly they call touch tone format we'll take we'll take 
it will take touch tone files for the PCB traces. Uh, we'll do one for the vias. For connectors, the connector company will supply a touch tone file for the connector. Mm -hmm. So you put all these together to build your channel. Mm -hmm. you see. But you need to make models of your each part first. So, so here you can save, uh, you can export touch tone format. You know, you'd give it the file name and, 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 and when you have a, a differential pair, it'll always be S4P as an extension. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you just give it a, you just give it a name, which you want and a number of steps and where you want to save it mm -hmm. and it'll export it. But I'm not going to do it now because it'll be already have it. Oh, yeah, okay. It's fine. But I want to make another point with Polar. Recently, in the later versions, they now have a way is a format for multiple line lengths. Okay. And you can save, you pick the directory where you want to save, but now you can save uh, one, like one inch, 2,000, 3,000. 4,000, mm -hmm. 5,000. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you will have all these in one model and you can connect to which one you want? Well, no. What this will do, when you export now, it'll save touchstone files for one inch, two inch, three Ah, inch. okay. You can have up whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So if you have 10, you can have 10 different touchstone files. Mm -hmm. And I did do that prior. Mm -hmm. So I have saved this. This is very, very useful. Mm -hmm. if you your camera to, uh, is off again <laughs> yeah if you want to do what if uh, what if analysis right you want to build a channel with different lengths you can do it all at once now mm -hmm. instead of having to go here and do all oh, one inch mm -hmm. run a simulation mm -hmm. you know two inch run a simulation. now you can basically do a series of them and it save all those at, at one during one time mm -hmm. very useful as we'll see. I would like to point out uh, when you use different uh, simulators, I know they can generate this kind of uh, S models for specific track in your PCB, but I have never seen uh, options for like setting all the kind of different parameters what uh, we could set here in this uh, Polar. Usually in standard simulators, uh, you can just use the standard parameters for PCB stack up. Yeah, different tools have different capabilities. Okay. Yeah, but uh, this is interesting because, for example, I was always thinking about how you include this uh, this uh, um, graph for different frequencies uh, in this kind of models because oh. uh, when you yeah. When you when you set up a stack up in standard simulator, you only set it for one specific frequency. You can't set it for all the frequencies. Well, no, that's right. That's why in here, for instance, all simulators will ask what's the DK and DF at one frequency, and it will make a model. Yeah, right? but then when you generate the uh, S model or S parameter, you have it. Uh, you have the correct loss for specific frequency based on this graph no oh yeah the total loss most things will most tools will just give you this blue line mm -hmm. right this thing is you know kind of nice to know but you don't really use these numbers yeah but i think most tools will just use one straight exactly. line and that's all you do when you do the touchstone file It'll only give you. Really ah, okay. So this is not include touch. Yeah. Okay. I okay. I understand now. Okay. I mean, it's. I mean, you could. Well, you won't be able to separate it from the touchstone, right? So what frequency uh, touchstone generates the S parameter for? For the minimum or Up maximum to, or middle 10, one? From ten to fifty gigahertz, our okay. touchstone file will be. Right. And then what touchstone the electric is what the electric the loss value it will use then? Pardon? So Repeat when it, it will generate the S parameter model yes. for this, all these frequencies, what dielectric loss it will use? Will it use different dielectric loss for different frequency? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's why this table, you know, that's why when we, when we calculate this, 
at each frequency, this is the DKDF yeah. that it's using. Right? But what I wanted to point out, normally standard simulators will not use different. You only fill up one. Uh, well, if it's a causal model like uh, Dakar model or, or uh, Dubai model or it will whatever, talk. Okay. If it's asking you for a frequency of the DK and DF, it's the same as this. Okay, but I never the... seen like select which model you would like to use. There is just put here the value. <laughs> uh, well, for instance, if you use Symbior, you know, they have similar uh, okay. one. ADS will have similar. Okay. HFSS, all the tools have. Okay, oh, maybe, maybe I just didn't notice because I had no idea what does it mean. Yeah, yeah, you need to make sure that you choose a causal dielectric model. Mm -hmm. And when you choose that option in the tool, it will then ask you what is the DKDF and what frequency. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it'll use, it'll know. Okay. After. Okay, perfect. Okay? Yeah. And the roughness, you know, they will have their own panel to come up and ask mm -hmm. for. That was what I showed you before. Mm -hmm. what they want. Oh, okay. I, I guess I never. I never really went into so much details because, as I said, I didn't know what does it mean and what to set. So maybe the other tools what I use, they actually have it. I just never noticed that because exactly. I never knew what does it mean. And That's why we are creating this video so everyone now knows what this aware. means and how to set it up. Yeah, be aware. That's all. You know, it's just to be aware of, of what you need to, to do for high-end, high multi-gigabit stuff, you need to understand it to get okay. accurate simulation. I mean, every tool will give you a number. At the end of the day, how does that match to what your thing is built, right? And that's why we do our signal integrity and modeling is to predict. So we need good models. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, this is the process. This is my process I follow. Uh, works fairly well. And I don't just... I mean, I have other tools as well. I own Symbior as well, um, you know, and I use Symbior for different things, mm -hmm. you know. But if I'm building something from scratch here, this is very quick. It gets, and more important, if you have two different tools, Polar is, is very user-friendly, um, very quick, and you can use it now to sanitize, for instance, a Symbior tool somewhat, mm -hmm. right? Or another tool. You know, if you're getting something, or if you have another tool that extracts your layout, your file, you know, you want to sort of get a feel for is that have I got something realistic? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a lot of other tools. You can compare are, them, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a good way to have two different tool sets in your toolbox. Mm -hmm. Not to say, oh, this one's better or worse. It's not the case. It's to validate that you mm -hmm. haven't made a a push button wrong mm -hmm. mistake mm -hmm. there's a lot of tools you have to go through panel and panel of things it's very easy to over over have an oversight of something and you always get an answer but if you're only trusting the one you're, everybody's human they make an error yeah so it's nice to validate something i so. actually i know the polar software is really good because many pcb manufacturers they will send you screenshots from polar and i wanted to I think uh, uh, I met them on some exhibition, PCB Waste or something like this. I think they always go there. Yeah. And I I asked for price and it was quite expensive because they always, I don't know if they still sell it like kind of whole package, which includes a lot of information for PC manufacturers, because I asked them if they could make version for, uh, for uh, like PCB layout engineers. And at that time, they told me, no, no, like cheaper version for, you know. Oh. Well, you know, this is SI9000. Now, Polar has, you know, their stack up planner and everything else. It doesn't have all this capability either. Oh, so maybe they have different versions now. So if someone would like to have a look, they, they can check yeah. their website. I think they, they have, have prices yeah. also on website. I don't remember. Yeah. So, you know. If they're doing just stack up, there's a version, I think, um, you have to go to find out. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, the 2D solver is all you need to do to make a stack up. 
if you want to do signal integrity modeling, now SI9000 is a better choice mm -hmm. because it offers a lot more capabilities. Mm -hmm. You can build your transmission line. Okay. So, so we have we have I the S parameter model. What next? Okay. So pretty much, I think we're you know I've saved all the files and I did the same exercise for the FR4, the 370HR. So I have a number of different lengths for both. Okay. So we basically have now our transmission line models that we want for the two. Okay. Okay. Very curious. I'm very uh, curious. So I'm going to stop there and then I'm going to come up here again. So where are we now? Ah, okay. So now let's talk about, we we'll want to model Vias. All right. And for that, uh, I'm going to use uh, ADS. Um, you can use ANSYS, HFSS. You can use Symbior. They have a nice tool. There's a number of tools out there you can model 3D, okay? I'm going to use ADS because that's, you know, the tool that I'm, uh, you know, kind of operating at it and I'm familiar with. So, <laughs> so I, I have this already set up uh, for it. So, I, you know, it, it takes a bit of, not a huge amount of time to set up, but it's it's fairly quick. But all 3D tools, eventually you'll end up with a 3D model of it. So for here, first of all, with uh, ADS, for instance, I'm going to pull, they have what they call like the substrate. You have to create mm -hmm. a substrate to uh, basically define what the material properties mm -hmm. are similar to polar mm -hmm. so you build your stack up and everything here so here you have a pre preg and right now i got 370 hr mm -hmm. for instance you go in into there i have to pull this window from there and you'd put in and here you see here's where uh you can use ads to do your stack up as well right it, it's it'll do the same job and be just as accurate but now when you in ADS, for instance, you, you click the dielectric and you go into this panel and here's where you would em enter your uh, DK and DF, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So you'd put in DK 3.29 for core, uh, 370HR. So you can have different, you can add These as are many, the materials, uh, what do you use in your stack up? Exactly. Mm -hmm. You can have as many as you want and you just choose which ones you want to put in. Mm -hmm. So here's where you put your DKDF here, real and tan delta, tan mm -hmm. D, right? And make sure the type is Svensson George Rec. That means it'll be causal. Oh, now. yeah, this is what I just mentioned. Yeah, yeah. that's where I didn't know. Yes. Now I see. Now I see. Yes. Is it? Okay. Yes. Now you put in the frequency at 10 gigahertz, right? And don't worry about low and high. Just keep that there. Mm -hmm. It's just 10 gig. So that's where. Most tools will have something like this, a panel that comes up, you know, to put in the properties, basically, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you apply it. So I'm just going to stop, cancel this just to... Mm -hmm. So basically you've done it. Here's your stack up here. You're just saying it's got copper and you, all your thicknesses. Mm -hmm. So you really make an equivalent stack up in the tool, okay? That's called the substrate file on it. So I'm just going to stop that. And when you when you do it now, when it does the simulation, it gets that data and makes the model. But now to build the model, so that's the substrate. So now we get into the VIA itself. All right. And so I pick the VIA stack here. And then now we start at the barrel. So the barrel tells uh, how long the whole VIA is. Mm -hmm. It goes through the whole board. So layer one to layer 19. We're drilling all the way through the board. Okay. That's where it starts with. Uh, and that's all we have to do. And then we want to back drill eventually from the bottom side. Mm -hmm. Okay. And on the right hand side, you can see, uh, you know, a little thing will show how much back drill And here. It's not very much back drill because you specify, uh, Ten mil. Yeah. I see. Stop. Uh, right now, I specified a stub length of ten mils mm -hmm. max. Right. So if you put so, an I zero, it would probably back drill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Right. So if you want, uh, you know, normally, or just try I, to try to change the end layer. I don't know to number two or three. We should see the back drilling longer. Well, well, here, here, this this panel here, barrel. Oh, okay. That's okay. I understand. It goes all the way through. I understand. Right now, pad stack, the pad stack now defines the uh, drill diameter. Mm -hmm. For instance, you put the drill diameter mm -hmm. of the drill, not the finished hole diameter, mm -hmm. the actual drill diameter you mm -hmm. have to put in. There is a difference. And then you have to put the back drill diameter that you mm -hmm. want to clear away. Mm -hmm. So I had put 10 mil drill in this model. Um, you can put eight mil, whatever drill that you're using for your model. And and if you do what if analysis, you can do, you know, if I used an eight mil drill, what is the impedance eventually? But I use 10 mil, 15 mil to clear away after the back drill. So the, it's a 15 mil drill, it'll clear all that copper out. Uh, the center to center distance of the via, that's where your pitch now of the via comes. So I picked a one millimeter uh, pitch via, okay? Mm -hmm. You pick that and it picks, you know, picks it all up. And then uh, here you put uh, layers with the feed. I don't, yeah, see this is layers with feed is uh, pad diameters. So with a 10 mil drill, I use 20 mil pad. And, uh, and if you don't have a feed coming in, uh, what is the the diameter so i mm -hmm. i don't want any i don't want any pads on, on the other layers yeah i see your layers so i put the same as the drill size mm -hmm. so there's no pads unless there's a trace coming to it so you basically that's your pads and why you it's not see. plated what does it i would expect it should be plated oh yeah you can plate you can put plating in thing and you put the thickness of the plate mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm for for the analysis for the via here it won't make uh it's mainly the outer the outer diameter with relationship to the i understand i understand yeah. yeah so you can put that if you want but yeah it the, doesn't make, yeah i understand a, the, because it goes inside of the hole yeah, basically not, it doesn't really influence what's happening yeah, around okay that's right that's right uh and microvias, I'm not using it, but you can specify if you had microvia, mm -hmm. build a model, whatever it is. Now here's the feed layers. This is where it's a, ah, it okay. a little... Here, so here you can change it, for example, only go to, to, la to right. layer for... three or something, and we should... Exactly. So I started with right now, the layer here is uh, the feed one is the top, mm -hmm. so single layer one, and feed two is layer eight, mm -hmm. right? Uh, here where where I picked it, you know, based on the stack up. Okay. Try to change if it. I, I just would like to see so, if it moves. Yeah, it does. There mm -hmm. it goes. And back drilling goes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can see it now. Perfect. That's the nice thing when you have the back drill option turned on, you can see how it uh mm -hmm. it helps I visualize seeing where things are. Mm -hmm. Okay. And making sure that you're gonna have a back drill, you know, ten mil sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Plus you can, uh, the view here, you can, like anything else is front, you can do some measuring of, of, of things. You know, you click here mm -hmm. and type of thing. You can- You can double check everything. Whatever, if you, if you mm -hmm. want, you have that capability. And you know, you can use that to, you know, measure the type of stuff there. Okay. Anyway, okay, okay, it's, I understand. It's there. So it's straight, pretty straightforward. And stitching vias, that's where... Um... Yeah, I've seen on the top. Yeah, I noticed there are, there are two ground vias, yeah. Yeah. You don't have, I mean, I put them in, but you, normally you have it. Normally this would be like a one millimeter BGA and for high speed. You, you, you'd probably have a, a pair and then you'd have ground uh, with it typically. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is typically what you'd see in a one millimeter pitch BGA. That's what I tried to emulate here mm -hmm. with, a, with a model. 
Okay, uh, and now we have to create the model, the S, again, well, S parameters or something? Yeah, so once, once we have our model built, we have our stack up, we have all the materials, then you just click the simulate. Now, it takes a while to simulate through. You click the normal simulate button. It'll go through simulation and eventually it'll, uh, let me just push that up a minute. Eventually you'll end up with the results here. Okay. Like when you hit simulate, it'll go through and each one of these things, it'll simulate each frequency and it'll take, you know, a few minutes to, to go through, right? All of it. Eventually then it spits out the results. So each simulation you'll have here. So let's just pick, it's finished now the simulation. Now I can show the S parameter results here. Mm -hmm. There's the results of the S parameters of, of that. And not only that, we can see the TDR results. Mm -hmm. So S parameters uh, will show us the loss and TDR will, loss, uh, will show us impedance. Yeah, the TDR is the impedance here. Mm -hmm. and here is the, here is the uh, impedance of the VIA uh, after simulation mm -hmm. right here. You know, it comes down to about, you know, 95 mm -hmm. ohms type of thing, which is, it's okay, right? So, you know, you play around with this until you get what you feel you want as, as the... Uh, and then how do you the, save it as, uh, as parameters? Right. Yeah, so after you have, let's just show the TDR plot again. <clears throat> so here is a single ended of each P and N, for instance, and then you have mixed mode, and this is differential. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that you have this, um, now you uh, file, go file, mm -hmm. export, export mm -hmm. as parameters, and then, you know, you open a data display and you fill in the panel just to export, and it, it, it'll export the S parameter of, of this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, four. So I've done that already. I have S parameters of uh, vias for uh, the two different dielectric properties or two different materials, mm -hmm. two different ISO, the FR4 and the high speed. Mm -hmm. I've got via models for, for both. Okay. Now we are going to connect everything together. So, so that's, that's the via model uh, pretty much. And here you can see comparing, for instance, the TDR simulation results. Uh, and here you, you bring now the model into ADS by itself, uh, just to look at the VS. I'll show you when we build the channel, but mm -hmm. now you can check both models. And here you can compare, the red one is uh, using a short VIA, for instance. Mm -hmm. I see, I and, see in the pictures, only from layer one to, I don't know, right. layer two or something. Mm -hmm. Right, and blue represents well, you can see long versus short, mm -hmm. okay, my model. Mm -hmm. So the file that, the file that we save is a short file. Mm -hmm. And this, this is one of the, one of the materials, mm -hmm. you know, for it. Um, anyway, so that's, that's good for the via simulation. Now here's an important part, dielectric anisotropy. And this is recent research that I've been doing. And it's important, especially when you're modeling vias, uh, because the DK that you find in the DK tables are not the DKs that you want to use for via modeling necessarily. So just a very brief, brief thing on what anisotropy means is all glass reinforced laminates are anisotropic, meaning uh, the E fields, the properties are different depending on the access, axes uh, generated. Mm -hmm. Because tracks are routed like this, but vias go... Right. Oh, hmm. right. So if I look at these three uh, pictures here on the left, starting on the left, if I put copper plates on the dielectric, and this is how your dielectric is normally, you've got the weave like this. And if you have your copper laminate on the top and bottom, and you're doing a transmission line, trace right it's this way and when when you energize that thing the electric fields between the copper 
E fields are perpendicular. So it's in the Z direction. Mm -hmm. okay? If I move the plates the other end and energize it, now the fields are in the X direction. Or if I put it this way, they're in the Y direction. Mm -hmm. So we assume that X and Y are going to be pretty much the same. So we just call it, I call it DKXY. Mm -hmm. So the, the fields are in plane. We call it in plane with, with the, the fiberglass weave. And this way, the fields are out of plane. Mm -hmm. So in, in Z, they go basically through the uh, yes. fibers. But in yeah. the X and Y, they can travel through fibers or through pre preg yeah. only. Right. And the way the things are, you know, it's how the, the things are. The capacitance is different. Mm -hmm. So when it's this way, each layer, because you have all these different layers of glass and everything, you know, like these layers, the, 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 the capacitances are basically in series with one another. So the DK is, is basically the capacitance. It's the ratio of capacitance of the dielectric compared to when you replace the dielectric with air. That's how you get DK. And when you, when you calculate capacitances in series, it's like, uh, it's like if they're, they, they end up in parallel. So anyway, there's equations to calculate the thing. And E fields the other way, uh, they're, they're kind of like in, in parallel now. So they, they, they calculate this in series. Anyway, that's the topic of, uh, I'm doing design comp paper, uh, understanding that, and uh, it'll describe it. Mm -hmm. But here's a nice picture showing the effect. So when uh, a transmission line these red, this red energy, that's the electric fields uh, as it's propagating at 20 gigahertz. So you can see we want DKZ. Mm -hmm. uh, we can way. see the difference. Like when it travels yeah. with the line, it's like nice. But yes. when it travels through via, there are these uh, right. like, I don't know, it's going out a little bit between the right. layers of laminates. Right. And what I'm getting at is, if you had DKZ, like say the data in the data sheet or whatever, it depends on how they measured the dielectric. Mm -hmm. It could be measured, the E fields end up being in plane or out of plane. It depends on the test fixture of the test method. So for instance, you know, the test method, if it gives a DKZ, for instance, the trace impedances will be right when you calculate the 2D solver, but your V impedances will be mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if the if the material properties reported in the data sheet is X, Y, mm -hmm. then the V impedances will be right, but DKZ mm -hmm. will be wrong. I understand. So I've developed a, a way, if you know how the dielectric was measured initially and reported in the data sheet or the DK tables, if you know how that was measured, I've developed a way to calculate uh, the 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 opposite. Mm -hmm. So now you'll have both, mm -hmm. and you would use the right one depending on what model you want. Mm -hmm. And here's these popular test methods used in the industry. Really, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that's what laminate suppliers use to test and report. Mm -hmm. So they have like the popular one is this clamp strip line. So mm -hmm. these three here, they will be out of plane. If if the data sheet says it's reference to this IPC number, split cylinder or split post, you know that the numbers are X, Y. Mm -hmm. Okay? And you could use things appropriately. Mm -hmm. And that's really what uh, my session's going to be about. Uh, uh, it's at 12.15 at DesignCon on Wednesday. Okay, if someone Punch doesn't know what DesignCon is, is really cool conference actually i've been there this yeah. year and a lot of uh, a lot of topics are about high, very high speed designs and there is pd and especially there are many very famous people and everyone can meet there like all the i think i've done actually a couple of videos with uh, some of the people who will be there uh, who are always there like yeah, steve well, sandler eric bogatin yeah. Uh, oh. You will be there. 
Then uh, everybody. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. Uh, uh, was I forgot what Sandra, the name of the Sandra symbi uh creator Yuri. Yuri will be there. Yuri Shep, yeah. yeah. Yuri Shep now from uh, Symbiar. Yeah. Or Symbarian. He'll be there. Uh, everybody. Uh, uh, um, Steve Sandler. Yeah, I mentioned Steve. Steve yeah. Uh, he'll be there. All all the ones uh, you know that you've you've had on your show. Or, it's it's the premier conference for uh, pretty much signal integrity and design, that kind of work, and power integrity too. Uh, they have, and also DesignCon will have automotive things they brought in uh, last couple of years mm -hmm. related. So it's it's a good conference. Um, many people go year to year. Um, so I will be forward. there too. I will be there. This will be first time since uh, 2020. So. I'll be back for so, you because I was there this year. Yeah, you went this year. I yeah. didn't go uh, yeah. this year, but I, I, I'm doing this paper and I'll be going. Everything's booked, ready. It's actually now it's two months away. Yeah, two months today it'll be finished. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I already booked uh, same hotel where I was before, very far away from the <laughs> from yeah. the conference because all the accommodation where the conference is it's like 200 dollars per night that's not yeah. for me <laughs> but you'll have a booth there too right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. this year which is good yeah okay we can move oh, okay no. yeah that, this is just the slide that went through and this was comparing the mm -hmm. this is comparing the implications of anisotropy so if there was six percent difference in dk depending how it was measured mm -hmm. then implication of your via mm -hmm. so if you measured with uh you know the blue one is here and say oh i everything's balanced nice and that was really using dkz mm -hmm. but really it's dkxy we need mm -hmm. and when you built the board oh your impedance is not going to be 90 95 or 96 there it's about uh what two or three ohms difference mm -hmm. here right is and it going to make big being, difference? It's what? Is it going to make big difference? Well, like... we'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I'll show some simulation, but uh, let's get to that. All right, to build the channel model. So here, here sort of is where we are. Okay. You can make it yeah, full but... screen because it's very, very yeah. small. Yeah. So let's make the thing so what i've done is i've already created a schematic but it's easy to create something from scratch so mm -hmm. let's just say a new just quickly just say a new cell create schematic mm -hmm. i'll end up I'm something curious. like here so you just call up like an s parameter mm -hmm. thing you know and it doesn't look like that so now you know first of all then you double click it and I guess and, you find the S parameter models what we created. And the for. S parameter might be, you know, uh, let's just mm -hmm. call it uh, uh, differential. You see, this is TG 3000, mm -hmm. 3000 mil. Okay, now it changes mm -hmm. to uh, what we want. Mm -hmm. Plus, display you can put on what the file name, which is nice. Because you can now see this mm -hmm. is the file name of the S parameter. So this is basically the one which we generated from Polar. Polar, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I have, as I said, I have all different lengths of traces in one inch increment, and I have a half inch one mm -hmm. as well. So you know, this is how you start. You you get one for your. Uh, this is the via for the transmission line, mm -hmm. and uh, you can copy and paste, for instance, here. And now you double click it and pick the file for shorter one. The, the via, differential oh, via okay, short. For via. Oh, okay. Right? Escape. So now mm -hmm. you have these. And the nice thing with ADS, you can take shortcuts, you can kiss it and then pull it, right? And now you copy this and paste it this way. But now. But you, you didn't change it to via. It's still 3000. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't change it to via no, yet. No. I, it, yeah, okay, skip. But I, I clicked it, but I didn't hit OK. Mm -hmm. See, when you go fast, that's what, what happened. It'll show up eventually. 
-hmm. This is differential via. Mm -hmm. Now you have to hit OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. Now it says diff via short, mm -hmm. right? Uh, now, you know, you copy this, paste it. But now you can't just connect here because one in so escape. So, for instance, one in three is the top of the via. Mm -hmm. and two and four are the inner layer, mm -hmm. right? Now, if we want to connect here, we have to swap it, I guess. We have to swap it. And uh, ADS, they have this mirror about y axis, mm -hmm. it swaps. It. So I, I'll just kiss it here. And pull mm -hmm. it out this way. And here mm -hmm. you can see two and four connects to mm -hmm. different. It's two and four is the inner layers, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's how you really build up your channel. Now you have your via your transmission line via mm -hmm. have another one for your connector that you'd put in and then you'd have another one of the of the actual PCB module. So I'm just going to close this mm -hmm. right now. And that's what you end up with when mm -hmm. we do that. Right. So where, where did you get the other modules? Which other models? Oh, uh, other models. So for the module, you will get one from uh, module manufacturer. Okay, yeah. Okay, I understand. So what we've done already, we've made a model of the vias mm -hmm. that we want. We made models of the transmission line. And mm -hmm. here, what I did was, because I have a, a one inch version, I made this model 11 inches. Mm -hmm. So I can, I have one inch increments plus you know, so I can go in steps of one inch. So mm -hmm. if I wanted to have 11 inches, instead of making 11 inches, mm -hmm. I just use plus one, mm -hmm. right? Similarly here, I have a half inch one because I want to go two and a half mm -hmm. just to have. Okay. Now, the, the next thing is the connector. Mm -hmm. You have to go to the connector vendor, like uh, Molex, for instance, or Samtech, mm -hmm. uh, or... Um, uh, Tyco, they will have connector models, mm -hmm. plus parameter models. Mm -hmm. And you, have, you need to get that, and uh, that'll be the model for your connector mm -hmm. that you're going to use in your channel. And then uh, the module. This represents back, let me, I'll just throw this up quickly. This, just to go back to near the beginning where we had our picture. <clears throat> That represents this one and a half dB. Mm -hmm. So I had created a a model that gave me one and a half dB mm -hmm. loss. Okay, I understand. It's just a transmission line mm -hmm. model that I've done, right? Just to represent the module. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what uh, what I, what is the next um, more? What, yeah, this, this one. Oh, this is a a nice feature of ADS. It'll convert the differential to, uh, sorry, convert single ended to differential easily. So we put a balance transformer. So that's basically like are, tra uh, uh, termination or ohm, something? It's 50 ohms to 100 ohm. So it allows us to look at this channel differentially mm -hmm. quickly, right? Otherwise, you need to use equations to, 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 Convert oh, from single. Oh, okay, okay. Because uh, because your uh, source is uh, single ended and your termination yes. is single ended, so you need this yeah. model to make it differential. Yeah. So balance transform is nice to convert from single ended mm -hmm. differential. Okay. So okay. that's the nice feature about ADS. It's quickly able to, to put that in. And now when I look at S parameters, it'll be differential already. I don't have to do funny things. Okay. okay. And you need to have this controller. And here's where you specify the frequency from 10. I megahertz. guess controller is one of the blocks there. Yeah. So you pull, if you want to do S parameter simulation, you go under, you know, your palette here and you pick simulation S parameters mm -hmm. and you pick a controller. Mm -hmm. like okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Basically. That's what it is. And then in the controller, the start frequency, you put 10. Stop, we want 50. And step size of 10 megahertz. Okay. I'm curious. Let's simulate something. Yeah. So right now, 
I've got a transmission line channel, or sorry, our channel is with TG400G and 370HR. And I've used, uh, this is worked out to be 11 inches. And you'll see why uh, after we see it. And this is two and a half inches. Mm -hmm. So what this represents, we can get uh, 11 inches long here, but only two and a half inches mm -hmm. long. You'll see You'll see why after I hit sim, uh, I want to shorten this. All right. So I'll hit simulate and it'll, it'll go through and it'll plot the thing. So you didn't see anything change because nothing changed. So I'm going to just turn that off, hit simulate. Oh, I've got a message. Thing. It didn't like me doing that. What I'll do is I'll turn one off. Just so that you see that there's yeah. some difference. Okay. okay. You see the thing was there. So normally you'd have your two channels there. I'm going to turn it back on again. And uh, now I'll run it. Now just watch here. You see, you'll see, you run the simulation. And now you see mm -hmm. the blue and the red. Okay. Okay. Which one is blue? Which one is red? Well, okay. So just a bit more explanation is uh, remember back here, I showed uh, these are the limit lines. Mm -hmm. Right. This is what we have to meet the spec mm -hmm. insertion loss and return loss. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is where we are here. Uh, you use an equation, ADS, you have an equation, you can plot this, mm -hmm. these limit Limits. lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now uh, your results will show up on the same graph. So uh, the red one is uh, what I have for the T line. That's 11 inches of the good material. Mm -hmm. So what it's saying is, at 11 inches, I'm, you know, I'm right you on the still limit meeting. line. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but, you know, it says, oh, that's good. I, I should be okay with it, right? Um, on this HR, three, you know, 370 HR, with just two and a half inches, uh, I'm close to the limit. Mm -hmm. If If I change this to, put this to, one inch, for instance. No, no, that's, put there 10. I'm curious. Similar length as the good material. Oh. <laughs> uh oh. All right. So 370 HR, I had 10 inches. I had 11 inches, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'll put 10 inches of uh, 370 HR. Uh, you don't have five. There is only 5,000 oh. is maximum. 5,000. Wait a minute. I should have, I thought I had a 10. You can set the another one for another five. Yeah, okay. I can put that, let's just put that to 5,000, mm -hmm. right? And so the I've other got, one, uh, you can change also the other one to 5,000. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so cancel. So what I'll do is, I, I had picked the via, I didn't pick oh, okay, the right sorry. one. Yeah, yeah so. So here, this is 370 HR. So a shortcut, because I have these names pretty much the same, I can just make that five, mm -hmm. right? And just add a zero here. Mm -hmm. Now that's, that's picked those models now. And, and change also the other one, five, five. So we have same. Okay. I, I'm very curious how big difference it is between the good and bad material. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. Good point. Good that you ask, you see. There you go. It's significantly less so for for short yeah. 
two inches, it was okay, it was fine. Yes. But yes. for 10 inches, it's completely failing. The standard FR4 material for 10 inches, right. you have to use special, really good material. That says here, you could not build this box with 370 HR, mm -hmm. at least to go for, to, to the end units. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe if things were short here, there, mm -hmm. or if you can mix layers, maybe some inner layers, those layers might be all right with the other, it depends your stack up. Mm -hmm. It's a trade off that you do. And that's what signal integrity modeling at the front end helps you do, makes you do those what ifs to see what will work, what won't work, mm -hmm. right? This is what, but you have to know the little details to do it. It's not just put a bunch of numbers in. Mm -hmm. That's why I tried to emphasize the different parts that affect the losses in, in things. Just go back, just to clarify, how do we know it's failing? Because the blue line is very far below the black line, yeah. which are the limits. We have to be above the black line to, to be considered a pass. Mm -hmm. So here our losses are so much, we got so much loss. The, the signal, not good yeah. signal will actually arrive to the model. Right, it's not gonna work. So uh, what I wanna do is go back to revert to the saved one, just because. Mm -hmm. And the return loss is basically same. Return loss is based on the or uh, kind of, it doesn't matter really about material, it's about the um, well, it does, structure or it does something. Away. It's just that our transmission lines, they're, they've been designed for 100 ohms. So mm -hmm. And they're, they're perfect narrow. 100 ohms, okay. But the vias, what's happening here is the via and the connector, they're 3D structures. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be 100 ohm exactly. You know how the via was 95, 93 ohm. So a lot of this stuff is caused by the via reflections. Mm -hmm. And that's why the impedance of the via is important because, you know, you could affect the, the return loss mm -hmm. in a sense. So this is one aspect and, you know, you can say, oh, wow, well, no, we, in this case, oh, we've met this line. Yeah, well, okay, you know, but unfortunately, you know, with 56 gig and now 112 gig, just because you've met the mask, not necessarily mean you met certain aspects of the spec. And that's why they've developed this channel operating margin uh, way. IEEE and the uh, OIF optical interface forum, they're starting to use uh, what they call channel operating margin. And basically it's a, uh, it's like a MATLAB type script that'll run and you have like an Excel file that it just reads parameters in uh, and those parameters are based on the spec that you're working on. And it goes in more detail. It'll work out the jitter and everything else. It's all part of it. I don't understand internals of the software. I just, just use it as a tool mm -hmm. and it'll output pass fail what you need. So what is the input for the software? Pardon? What is the input for the software? Well, the input of software is uh, the channel. Okay, so we generate uh, channel, it means like as parameter of the whole channel? Yeah, or? exactly what this whole channel, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to show this right now, basically. Uh, I'm going to hide this. I'm going to talk about now channel model using COM. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a little bit different. I see beginning and end is a little bit different. The mm -hmm. channel model, it, it, it's different. So let me get into that for a minute. <laughs> so this is what we've done that S parameters to check against the S parameters. It's frequency domain stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. We do that when we run that com, or if we want to look at eye diagrams, you would do the same thing. Use the, use this channel simulator mm -hmm. like we picked here we're going to simulate a channel mm -hmm. channel model channel sim and now we have a, a, a you know connector whatever whatever one we want in this palette and you have a, a driver 
and a receiver, mm -hmm. whatever model you want, you put here. So I picked the differential TX and RX. Mm -hmm. And if you have the model of the CERDES, you know, IBIS AMI model. From the chip you, manufacturer. From the chip, you mm -hmm. could you do the same thing. I don't have anything for that. Mm -hmm. But if you did, you would run it the same way, except you would, you know, use the IBIS AMI option. Mm -hmm. Here's where you do the settings right here, because right now it's for calm. Mm -hmm. When you do bit by bit or statistical, it wants to have an IBIS AMI model mm -hmm. from the manufacturer. But I'm just going to do calm right now. So mm -hmm. it's going to do calm simulation. So cancel that. And basically it's the same channel model here, but you get rid of those balance mm -hmm. transformers because you want to connect in as you would a P and N. Real, real right? stuff. Yeah. So now this is your channel. It's the same channel as above. So this top one is the uh, 400G and this bottom one is the 370HR, right? But the bottom uh, one doesn't have beginning. I know. We're not doing both together. Ah, doing okay. The... okay. So I just turn everything off and just restrict it to one thing only. Okay. So, so the first one is what? The first one is the here. Okay. Okay. First one is the better material. Mm -hmm. There, this way it's it's better. Let's let's just we don't need this anymore for now. I'll just blow this up. Right. Now this simulation when I click it, I don't know, today it just seems to take a long time and maybe when we're on this video, it may take even longer because of the bandwidth of the channel. But generally, you'll click it. And what I'll do is um, I'll let it run it. If it finishes, then we're still talking. No, 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 no don't, don't run it because maybe yeah, your computer will slow down. You, you already generated something, yeah? So how do yeah. you, so you run so, it and then what it will generate a file or something? Yes, so what it will do is um, what I had done quickly because I was hopefully anticipating. So what I'm going to do is just just for a second, I had made a bit of a screen capture just before the call because I was testing this out to make sure things would would work out. Yeah. So I'm going to show when you click when you click the the run button. It takes a while and, and it goes through the whole thing. And as it's running, you're going to get different pop-up windows that show up. Mm -hmm. And these pop-up windows, they're useful for different things. They're not as important necessarily. They just tell, they tell you about different things, voltage path. The most important thing we're looking at is these calm results in this green and this red box. Mm -hmm. When everything finishes, it spits out basically these two boxes. And that's mainly when it's a pass fail. Now, the reason for the two boxes is when it does this channel model simulation, if I just go back to, to this picture uh, at the beginning, it only, uh, your channel model is only from via to this module at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the COM also now uh, has provisions. You can add a package model, mm -hmm. if you have it, of the package to do the simulation. If you don't have the package, they have a long, what they call long package and short package, means got more loss in the longer versus the shorter. Mm -hmm. The COM will run two simulations with a short package called case one mm -hmm. and with a long package mm -hmm. case two. Uh, when w this final red one has both in it, but you know, it's the same numbers. It's mm -hmm. just yeah, really I see, I see. bottom. Up. But the nice thing when it plots both is you, you can see, oh, the first case passed, the second case didn't. Okay. But it says pass, pass. <laughs> well, sorry. Ah, uh, okay, fail, EH fail. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah. 
and this is eye height. Eye height was oh, 30. Okay. Eye height. And, and VEC is a vertical eye closure. And it had, you know, there's a specification that it has to meet. Mm -hmm. It passed. But this effective return loss now, this is a relatively new thing in the COM uh, for chip to module. You know, it's around 11 dB as a spec. And here, uh, uh, it passed effective return loss case one. Uh, in case two, uh, eye height failed. The eye height for uh, the BS spec is 32 millivolts. So here it failed and, uh, and uh, the other ones passed. Mm -hmm. So this right? COMO feature is directly integrated in the ADS. Uh, ADS has mm -hmm. it. Okay. So I just made a screen capture because when it runs, it spits out all of mm -hmm. these windows. Mm -hmm. You would see all of that. Um, I would ra I would go now to my slides because I had summarized things a little better okay. in the slides here. So what's important here is to see uh, to see this. This red one is the TG four hundred. It's the good one. We got eleven inches. And we got two and a half inches here. And you can see that we've met the guidelines here pretty much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here the return loss was pretty but good. But it still can fail for the right. longer package. But you can see here, when we run the COM and we have the short package uh, in, in, in it, it passes okay. Mm -hmm. But when we have the long package, it failed, mm -hmm. right? even though it seemed to match here mm -hmm. because this line in the spec doesn't include packages. Mm -hmm. See, and if I come back here, when we look when it, when the com runs, it plots the S parameters too, but this dotted line that's showing here, now this is the long package mm -hmm. that's in there, right? It's the equivalent of the package mm -hmm. it puts in when it runs calm, okay? So all I'm saying, that's why they have now have this calm metric because some channels would pass the S parameter mask, but still fail. And other channels might fail this mask, but still be able to work, mm -hmm. right? So that's why we have channel operating margin in these standards now for certainly 56 gig and 112 gig and 224 coming up you know, in the future, mm -hmm. there'll be more of the calm. So ADS has a built in, it, it, it runs on MATLAB, but it, you don't need to have MATLAB, it has a runtime in it. Mm -hmm. So it'll go and it has the, uh, it has the spreadsheets as well, part of ADS. But if you don't have ADS, it'll, and you have MATLAB, you can run MATLAB, uh, native MATLAB, as long as you have the full channel. Mm -hmm. But before you do that, you have to make this into just one S parameter mm -hmm. of, of the whole channel. Mm -hmm. right. I understand. You and can what do is, that in ADS. What is interesting, whatever. even the uh, standard FR4 material pass when it's short. When it's short, exactly. Yeah. But you only have like two and a half inches. Yeah. But still, I think that's really good to know because... Oh, yeah. Because, because some people yeah, because, they 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 really would like to buy or use the very expensive materials and it it may not be necessary right or mix and match if the material is compatible some layers may be able to be fr4 type right yeah we need to do simulation first but or a lower grade material maybe not the highest uh tg maybe it's uh you know fr408 which is like a little better, right? You might be able to get, or a Panasonic uh, Meg 4, for instance, you might be get away instead of Meg 6, Meg 7. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You That's where it's important where you compare your materials before and try and choose. Do this what if analysis first. You know, there's a lot of things you can do on your own and you need to do this when you're architecting your system, especially even PCIe cards. A lot of them are PCIe, but they still have a front module, right? But they're very small. So you might have an FPGA talking to a module 
but because a PCIe card is so small, it might only be two inches long, right? Yeah. They may not need uh, this big stuff. Yeah. So you need to do this work to make that decision. And that's yeah. what signal integrity channel modeling is about is to make the decision, cost effective decision. This, this was so cool, Bert. I, I really like this a lot. I, for a very long time, I wanted to make video like this. So thank you so much for preparing all these materials and explaining. Yeah, you're welcome. It's uh, it's very high level view and we went through quickly and everything, but uh, yeah, it's um, each one of these, you know, you could spend a lot of time and more detail into it. Um, but you know, when we do, when we do these pizza box designs, this is basically the process mm -hmm. that I go through. Mm -hmm. Basically, when someone is designing large PCBs, larger systems, like dimension, large dimensions, they definitely will need to simulate when they run oh. about five gigahertz. Yeah. 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 The, the higher in frequency you go, the less luck you have, the more oh. you need to simulate, you know. Okay. Um, so yeah. thank you so much. I really hope for... Uh, everyone finds this uh, super useful and when they are designing i don't know pci express generation 20 <laughs> yeah, then they will know how sure. to simulate their boards even as you say pci generation 3 pci express generation 3 still yeah. may need this kind of simulation yeah. if tracks are very long that's right but but pcie you know as i say you may have pcie on there gen 3 or gen 4 but even Gen 5 and 6, it's up in the same range now, right? Now you're going to have to think about this. But now the spec will be different. It's not necessarily yeah, yeah, yeah. this. But, you know, the, 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 the thing is the same. You build the channel the same. How you simulate after to meet the spec is unique to the, to the standard, yeah, yeah. right? And I learned so. a lot about you know, these PCB parameters and... Uh, in Polar, what everything you could say, and I, I, I had no idea you can do, uh, you can generate the S parameters from, from Polar, for example. And so, yeah. yeah. Okay, so thank you so much, Bert, again. And uh, yeah. let's, let's meet you in person in a few months. Yeah, in two months, we'll, uh, we'll meet in person for sure. Thank you for having me here. It's, uh, I really enjoyed it. I hope uh, things work out and uh, be good. Good to see you. I, I like this a lot, so thank you. Okay, you're welcome. And uh, that's everything. Thank you very much for watching this video. By the way, we are preparing some very interesting tutorials, so if you don't want to miss them, hit the subscribe button. If you want, you can also check out our FedEvel online courses, where you will find everything important from basic board design up to advanced hardware design and PCB layout. The link is in the description. That's all for this video. Thank you again. Don't forget to leave your comments and see you next time. Bye!